me know when we're ready, okay? Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to this faculty community conversation about our plans for campus as students, faculty, and staff return to campus for the fall semester. I want to introduce myself. I'm Lloyd Kramer, in case you don't recognize me behind my mask. And I want to explain what we're doing today. The Faculty Executive Committee and Advisory Committee have been meeting regularly with the Chancellor and the Provost, but our Chair-elect, Mimi Chapman, and I proposed that a broader community conversation would be valuable. So I want to thank Chancellor Guskowitz and Provost Bluen for quickly agreeing to that such a conversation would be useful, and I thank all of you for joining us along with the Chancellor and others. We are having a hybrid meeting today. This is a, an example of what some classes may look like this fall, because there are a few people in the room all wearing masks. There are all, they are all socially distanced. And then there are many others joining the meeting remotely through Zoom. And this is exactly the way some classes may operate and no one is closer to the speakers here than 15 or 18 feet. The Faculty Executive Committee has recently completed a survey of faculty opinions about returning to teach in the fall, and the quantitative results of that survey have been posted on the Office of Faculty Governance website in the news section. And we've also been compiling open-ended written comments as well as the overall statistical patterns. And Mimi Chapman led a faculty working group that wrote the survey and began interpreting the results at the most recent meeting of the Faculty Executive Committee. And Mimi will use these comments as a way to frame the first part of the discussion today. Then we'll move into a range of questions that have been submitted from chairs of the faculty committees, and I'm going to be calling on some of those committee chairs and then we'll also have time for other faculty colleagues to make comments. We'll also hear some comments from the chair of the employee forum and from the undergraduate and graduate student leaders. So we are gathering now at a time of great social and cultural and economic upheaval in the United States. And all of our lives have obviously been challenged and transformed by the COVID panic, pandemic. But equally important, we are living in the midst of another, though related, upheaval in the continuing national struggle against racism and racial injustices in American society. And since the murder of George Floyd in Minnesota in late May, our streets have been filled with demonstrators condemning racism and the anti-Black violence of some police officers in cities around the United States. We know that the history of racism goes back to the 17th century, and we can't understand it without knowing the history of slavery, and we can't understand the current events if we don't understand the history of Jim Crow. And I mention this because we are gathering today on Juneteenth. Juneteenth, the day that marks the end of slavery in the last community in America, in Texas, in the 1860s, on June the 19th, 1865, when a Union general brought the news that slavery had been abolished and that formerly enslaved people would henceforth be free and would receive wages for their work. And this became more official with the passage of the 13th Amendment in December of 1865. But we know that real freedom was deferred by all kinds of later restrictions on voting rights and equal education and equal access to housing and housing loans. And there would be terrible assaults on black communities over the following decades, including thousands of lynchings and brutal race massacres in which white mobs attacked black communities and killed hundreds of black people in cities such as Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898 and Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. So I want to begin our community meeting today by noting this is Juneteenth, 
and by remembering the people who have suffered from the history of racism in America, and also by honoring the people of color, including indigenous people who have suffered and died because of racist policies and actions. But we're also here to discuss how we can understand our plans for a successful and equitable reopening of this university. Because people who work at universities have to apply their analytical skills and creative thinking to their own institutions. And that's what we're going to do today. We have to apply our skills to the plans for teaching in a pandemic, as well as our response to our own history of institutional racism, which dates back to the earliest years of the university. We've seen controversial efforts to confront that history in debates about the Confederate statue and the struggle to finally remove the statue from our campus. But the names on many of our campus buildings also carry the legacy of the slave system and white supremacy. And now we're trying to come to terms with that history as well. Our board of trustees voted on Wednesday to rescind a moratorium on changing the names of buildings, which have been put, this moratorium had been put in place back in 2015. This action marks another step in the honest reckoning with our UNC history, which is also the task of our Commission on History, Race, and a Way Forward under the leadership of our colleagues, Pat Parker and Jim Malutis. So all of these developments, the ongoing COVID pandemic, the nationwide challenge to systemic racism, and the honest engagement with our own history have created the context in which we are gathering for this community conversation about where we go from here. And we're gonna begin the discussion with a very brief comment from our Chancellor, Kevin Guskowitz, and then Mimi Chapman will lead the first 50 minutes of our discussion. Kevin, you have a microphone there. Is that better? Great. Okay, thank you. First of all, I want to uh, I want to thank Lloyd for your incredible leadership. I don't know. This may be the. I know that you have two weeks left uh, in your role as chair of the faculty. I'm off camera. All right. Is that better? Okay. Just want to take an opportunity to thank you. This may be the last time that uh, we're you know face to face, mask to mask, uh, uh, in a setting. Uh, I just want to thank you for your incredible leadership of the faculty over these past uh, past year and uh, done a, a great job and great partnership and uh, during some challenging times and we're not done we're going to continue to work closely together but you've been been a great partner Mimi thank you my back is to you but thank you for for uh, saying yes and uh, you're, I think we're going to have a, a great partnership and uh, you've uh, already shown the ways in which we're going to work together with the faculty and uh, the administration so thank you and uh, Van likewise appreciate everything so uh, I just want to say that um, the unrest across the country right now, uh, along with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, has created some of the greatest, perhaps the greatest challenge, intersection of challenges that higher education has ever faced. And I could not be uh, more proud of the way our faculty, staff, students, and uh, leadership team has really stepped in uh, to address both of these challenges that we're facing. And uh, this is just one example of that, where we have uh, faculty and, and staff and, and uh, experts in infectious disease and uh, uh, public health uh, joining us with our experts in the, the uh, uh, space in, around diversity and inclusion and equity with us to talk about these, these challenges. But we're, uh, we're going to get through this together. Uh, we are, uh, as Lloyd just said, had a, a really big step forward this past Wednesday. Could not have been happier with the decision of our trustees to lift the moratorium. Uh, which is going to allow us to make uh, more changes. Uh, the History, Race, and Way Forward Commission that I charged back in February uh, will, uh, they have been working even throughout these past four months with the pandemic, but uh, I know that this is going to uh, allow them to move forward uh, in a in a even more important way, uh, in a way in which I know that they're going to uh, bring recommendations uh, and the, their scholarship to this process. Uh, with the uh, moratorium having been lifted. So uh, we'll, you'll be hearing more about that over the next uh, several weeks and, and months ahead. I want to also um, thank the faculty, 
um, staff, leadership, uh, members of our leadership team who have spoken out uh, in support of our uh, black community and uh, during this dif difficult time. And I think many people have spoken up. It's made a difference. And I think uh, the uh, campus community is um, um, making a difference. So we're, we're grateful for that. And with respect to the pandemic and the roadmap for the fall 2020, we are uh, really pleased with the progress we're making. And uh, Provost Bluen is uh, leading the uh, implementation team now and meeting daily uh, with that team. And we're taking a lot of feedback as I, Bob and I put a message out uh, yesterday, uh, late day, uh, about the progress we're making, responding to so many of the questions and concerns that have been raised. And uh, I just feel as if we're, um, uh, each day we're making progress, but there are still a lot of unanswered questions, and I understand that's what we're going to be talking about today. So uh, I just want to thank all of you for joining us. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass it to Mimi. Hi, everyone in the room and on Zoom. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this community conversation. This may or may not... E e I actually, let me rephrase that. I think this probably will be the first of several community conversations that we will have. There is probably no way in one two hour session to cover the range of questions that um, people have, the range of concerns, allowing people to give voice to their various concerns. And I wanted to start uh, at our last uh, faculty executive committee meeting. Um, Jim Thomas from Public Health joined us, who is an ethicist who focuses on pandemics. And he said that the most valuable tool in a pandemic is not masks, it's not um, hand sanitizer, it's not soap, it is trust. And what Lloyd and I want to do with these conversations that we're having both within the faculty executive committee within the advisory committee and now here as a community conversation is to allow questions to surface concerns to surface um, find out what answers we know now what we may know in the future um, all in the name of increasing trust so to that end we did um, do the survey that Lloyd referenced and there were well over 400 comments in the open-ended comments section uh, from the people that responded to the survey. And what I've tried to do today to start our conversation is just to do, pick out some of them, um, some illustrative quotes, and then questions that derive from those quotes. So that's what we're, we're gonna spend our next hour doing. So starting out, um, as it is, I still don't know how I will be teaching, and classes start in two months. You remember the survey was done a couple weeks ago. Time is running out for me to adequately prepare for two, model, two new teaching models in all my classes. And then another quote, high flex teaching sounds like a good idea, but without investment in needed equipment, it's bound to fail. So the questions that I would ask our panelists to respond to is when will we know about class schedules? Um, are all classrooms being retrofitted for high flex teaching or hybrid teaching? And um, are extra resources available to help faculty prepare? So who might be able to speak to some of this? Scott, uh, Lauren is, oh, Lauren's not, Lauren's not here. Is Lauren on the? Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. I think I just got promoted to a panelist. Hold on. We can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so the question about, I can answer parts of that question, but maybe not all of the questions. So some of it might have to be emailed by others on the panel. Right now, what we're doing, and many of you know what we're doing, is we're getting data from the college and the professional schools as to how the courses are going to be taught that's all due back to us next week. Essentially, what our plan is, is that we will update in a mass upload to Connect Carolina, the shift in the schedule of classes, along with the update to the modes of instruction. 
So then the view will be available to students. I think that's the part of your question you were asking that I can answer. Okay, so people should know about their schedules, about any kind of changes in their teaching schedules by about when? So in the system, because I'm getting the, I'm getting the information from the college and from the professional schools. So we will update the system next week so the view should be available by July 1st. Now this is a first pass. So ultimately we expect that there'll be changes from departments where they may need to make some adjustments to some of the times or some of the days. We will not be doing locations at that point. Locations will happen at the end of that week. But in the view, what you'll be able to see is how your course will be taught based on what was provided to us by, your, by either the college or the professional school and what time that maps to to the standard meeting pattern or non-standard meeting pattern, because we're also planning for that as well. Okay. Bob, is there anything you would like to add or? Okay. Yeah, so my, uh, my, my comment was that uh, we uh, have gone ahead and ordered um, a lot of the technology that is needed to equip uh, the classrooms. Uh, a high priority was given to first pass through uh, the college uh, and the uh, general purpose classrooms to make sure that those are all ready to go. Thank you. Another thing, uh, and I know that uh, Todd Nicolette uh, and his team um, have been working with uh, uh, a, a group of graduate students and education uh, design experts and have been working with many of our faculty and if faculty have specific uh, needs and they want to, um, some, some additional help, uh, I would just encourage them to reach out to Todd. So, and that would be through the Center for Faculty Excellence website where they would do that. Okay. Um, uh, many buildings do not have adequate supplies in bathrooms, paper towels, soap, et cetera. Another quote, my concern is not for the policies, but the limited resources for implementation. It's been years since my building has had adequate housekeeping services for the bathrooms. There are many doorknobs and it is a high touch environment. And then a question about whether the housekeepers will receive hazard pay. My uninformed sense is that there are not yet plans to increase the housekeeping staff. So all taken together, the question becomes, what are the specific plans about housekeeping and cleaning of buildings? Kathy, is that something you could speak to? Sure, I can speak um, to the first part of the question. So housekeeping has um, initiated enhanced cleaning multiple times a day in the research building since they were the first ones to come back. Um, I believe they're doing that four times a day. So enhanced cleaning is those high touch surfaces like the doorknobs that were mentioned, um, elevator buttons, those sorts of things. And then at night, they're doing a detailed cleaning. And the plan is for that to spread to all campus buildings. Um, in the fall, and I do know that they are um, looking to hire additional staff. And do we need, oh, Bob? And, and uh, th there will be additional uh, cleaning that will take place across the entire campus. Um, 
uh, and there will be new guidances uh, that in between classes uh, as uh, to how seats and um, other things will be cleaned. A, a lot of that will be the responsibility of the student and the faculty to do their own personal areas, but there will be cleaning that will include doorknobs, doors, um, the, the, the main entrances, et cetera, that, that there will be high touches to, including bathroom areas throughout the day. So what we're hearing, just to make sure everybody on Zoom is hearing this so far, is that there will be enhanced cleaning. More housekeeping staff are indeed being hired in multiple cleanings throughout the day. Faculty and students will have some responsibility for cleaning their immediate areas um, as they are leaving classrooms. And Dr. Weber wants to join us too. Yes, I just wanted to say that. You have to keep the button press down. Just wanted to say that this is uh, an envelope virus and it's uh, easily uh, killed by in 10 seconds by any of the standard disinfectants we would use and similarly by any of the waterless alcohol products we would use for hand hygiene that have 60 to 90 percent alcohol will kill this virus within 10 seconds. So um, I'm going to ask everybody when you speak to introduce yourselves on the Zoom call. Uh, but so. We just heard from Dr. David Weber from Infectious Disease. We also heard from Kathy Brennan from Environment, Health, and Safety, and of course from Bob Lewin, who we all know, the provost. And Mimi, if I can just add, uh, yes. this is Kevin Guskowitz. Uh, we, we are just finishing the second week of the ramp up for our on-campus research operations, and uh, we're checking in daily on that to see how that's going, and it's going very well. So uh, we've said uh, repeatedly that we would use that ramp up uh, to help guide us in uh, in how we think about the ramp up to uh, instruction on campus uh, as we move through the summer and into the fall. Um, a lot of people are concerned, of course, about the rising numbers, case numbers in North Carolina and rising hospitalizations. So. Um, I, like most, have worries about infection, but I feel we have to adapt to a new normal. Bus drivers, grocery store clerks, and others have already had to step up to do their jobs for the good of the community, and ditto for K-12 through teachers in the fall. Another comment, I believe there will be a vaccine and that we are opening the state too quickly. The fall plan should reflect, reflect the fact that coronavirus numbers are increasing every day. So what is the relationship between the state's numbers going up and our campus decision making? Um, is the administration in regular contact with the governor and the state health director? And what is the current state of the science on a vaccine timeline? And anything else you might want to say in, in response to these comments? Dr. Weber? So let me start off and mention the uh, vaccine. This is David Weber. I'm actually a member of the Centers for Disease Control uh, ACIP advisory group uh, that will make recommendations on vaccine use. There are many, many, more than 100 now vaccines in some type of development, uh, and we hope certainly that they're successful. But it, just because the actual testing to prove safety and effectiveness of a vaccine takes uh, is so difficult, I would not envision we'll have a vaccine, certainly not this calendar year, and likely not uh, for 12 months. Uh, I'll defer the answers about the campus uh, there, but uh, we cannot obviously plan on a vaccine, one that it would work, and certainly not for the forthcoming academic year. All right. Um, would anybody like to speak to uh, the relationship with the state and the state's numbers? Uh, this is Bob Lewin. Um, uh, we are working very closely with the state. Uh, we're, we're staying in close contact with them. Uh, we get a twice a week update on the numbers uh, through uh, Kathy, um, and, and we're monitoring um, all of the state numbers, the county numbers, uh, and we're in constant communication with the uh, Orange County uh, Department of Public Health. And, and I think that uh, we all are a bit concerned, you know, about the changing uh, numbers and the fact that the uh, state of North Carolina is, uh, in the opinion of many, uh, moving in the wrong direction. Uh, and so we are going to monitor that really carefully, uh, just like everybody else will. 
and that will be uh, an important consideration as we move forward. This is Kevin Guskowitz. I, I would just add that um, uh, Mike Cohen, David Weber, uh, uh, others on the team, the infectious disease public health team, continue to remind us that we know so much more about this virus today than we did just four months ago, and that we're going to know a lot more about it in four months from now, and certainly this time next year. Uh, we've been asked a lot about off-ramps off of our roadmap, and I know that uh, many people have questions about that, and uh, that team is working uh, to develop what those off-ramps will look like. They've told us that uh, it would probably be early July whenever they would uh, be able to provide more guidance around that, but it's very likely going to look at um, the magnitude of infections uh, uh, that would be potentially overwhelming the healthcare system would be part of, uh, uh, you know, considering an off-ramp as well as the, um, uh, you know, students that are, uh, how people are complying with the uh, safety measures we're putting in place, the community standards we're putting in place. So we're going to be monitoring that compliance is going to be a, likely a part of that. But we'll have more on the uh, on these uh, off-ramps for the roadmap uh, uh, over the next probably 10 days to two weeks. So it sounds like, are you, so you're saying that there will be kind of quite specific metrics for considering an off-ramp? Is that, am I hearing that right? There will be areas of consideration such as, uh, you know, our, as I already said, so our isolation space, if, if we're reaching a capacity on that, or the hospitals are becoming overwhelmed, the healthcare system, uh, or again around compliance. I don't know that we're going to have specific numbers, percentages of each of those, but those are the general areas that we're looking at. And we've been talking about for several weeks about what clusters would look like. We talked about that very early on that we would look for trends and, and clusters of potentially positive cases in certain parts of, of campus or certain groups on campus to help uh, inform us about a need for an off ramp. I would agree, and uh, this is Bob Lewin, uh, and just say that there are uh, probably going to be um, in the neighborhood of eight, eight to 12 categories of factors that would play in to, to an off-ramp decision, trying to minimize that there would be just a singular point of reference, but rather um, a, a broad range uh, and a collection of these broad ranges that would ultimately influence a decision. Dr. Weber, could you speak to the concern of the rising numbers um, in the state? Certainly. Uh, so it's uh, it's not surprising that as we've seen uh, more people in congregate settings and uh, certainly from personal observations, some people not using masks. And we know masks are highly protective, as is uh, uh, physical distancing. We've seen an increase, particularly a number of states are even more liberalized their uh, requirements than around us. And we've seen uh, some reaction, including in, in um, Orange County uh, now requiring masks in public uh, places. I do believe that if people physical distance and wear masks and uh, practice uh, uh, good hand hygiene, uh, that we can safely uh, uh, open the campus and that uh, we can prevent this increase to the extent that people in public are not following the recommendations, then we will see uh, increases. Uh, both locally and, and nationally. Thank you. Is there anything being done with regard to curbing Greek life, large parties, rush, recruitment? Part of this plan seems to assume a closed community with geographic borders. How will you discourage student travel? Another comment, I'm especially concerned about UNC's plans for sporting events. I would prefer not to have any spectators, but if there is a plan for attended games, will there be a limit on attendance? So um, this leads to questions about, um, is there coordination going on with the fraternities and sororities um, and other groups on campus, other social clubs and um, clubs, the band, or you know, whatever, where students are uh, getting together a lot. And then next, when will community standards and enforcement plans be announced? And what are the plans for athletics as well as other traditions like Halloween um, on Franklin Street? Let me take a, a few of those and, and then pass them to, to Bob and David, perhaps, uh, and others. Uh, we. Uh, 
we're have we had meetings most of the week around community standards. We had some really, uh, and some of you may have joined those conversations. I, I know Shana was on one of them, where we're looking at the at the community standards, being sure that we have the right ones. We're, we've been using, you know, the guidance of our infectious disease public health experts have been extremely helpful. But we, we've been, we're involving our ethicists as well, the faculty who, who as we mentioned earlier, uh, think about the things through that lens. We're engaging students, uh, faculty, staff, because we don't want to miss something. So those community standards uh, are already on the Carolina Together website. But as we've said, they may change as we learn more over the next several weeks. Uh, and then we're looking at the ways in which we'll need to enforce them. And uh, there are some really good ideas emerging around that. And uh, with regard to athletics, uh, I don't know. As we, as we sit here today on uh, June, what is today, the 18th, 19th, 19th, that we will, uh, that we'll have an athletic season, but we are gradually bringing student athletes back to begin uh, their workouts in small group settings because if there is going to be a sports season in August, they have to be conditioned properly. And uh, I could not imagine a situation where we're going to see Keenan Stadium uh, filled to capacity this fall. I, I, I think if we have a football season, it's uh, highly likely that it'll be played either uh, without fans or with a very reduced um, capacity and I know that they've athletics facilities uh, experts have already looked at how they would map out a stadium with uh, groups of four six seats and clusters if you will around the, and that's a different kind of cluster uh, but uh, where they would be seated uh, safely uh, socially distancing uh, there would likely not be concessions and all the things that could potentially uh, create spread so uh, there's a lot of work being done to look at this but we can, we we do not know if uh, there will be a, a sports season as we sit here today and what about halloween anything i mean i'll just say that uh, we we have a wonderful working relationship with the town of chapel hill and carborough we've had meetings just this week uh, with uh, the mayors and the town managers talking about just i think we're right now we're focused on july and august uh, but um, uh, again there are many decisions still to come as we better understand the uh, the you know how the virus evolves and and uh, when there may be uh, the possibility of a second wave uh, later in in november december is reeves on the line is as a panelist is he a Reeves, would you have anything that you would want to say in response to, to these questions and comments? Uh, hey, everyone. Um, my name is Reeves Mosley. Um, I'm the student body president this year. Um, I've been reading through the, the chat webinar, and I, you know, I agree with a lot of the faculty. I've had the opportunity to be in some conversations with Chancellor Guskowitz and a lot of the university leaders this past week and, and previous weeks about you know, what everything's going to look like. And I've addressed a lot of the concerns that a lot of my peers and faculty members um, and the community has, but I, I, one of the biggest concerns that I have right now is how do we navigate dictating if student, like how students can wear masks. And, you know, a lot of students are saying that they're just going to claim it's for a religious reason or um, claim that they have pre-existing health conditions so that they won't have to wear a mask, but in reality, they just don't want to wear a mask. So that's one of my biggest concerns is, you know, if we're going to pre protect our fellow peers and, and faculty members inside of actual classrooms, how are we going to be able to to differentiate people who actually can't wear masks and people who are just claiming because for some reason wearing masks has become politicized in the past couple of weeks. Um, that's one of my biggest concerns right now, among others. So you're hearing from students, Reeves, that you that there are students that are really not on board with wearing masks. I mean, it, can you tell us? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, ab sorry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, a lot of my peers, a lot of students are on board with wearing masks, but a lot of them at the same time are, are thinking they're immune to this disease because a lot of young people are, um, are asymptomatic to the virus. So, you know, they assume they don't have it. They're kind of disregarding the people around them. Um, so a lot of them are saying, you know, I'd rather just be able to live my life and you know, live my senior year, my freshman year, my sophomore and junior year, et cetera, um, and not have to wear a mask, be as close to normal as possible. 
And, you know, with, with the conversations I've had with administrators, we're trying to navigate setting a community standard as, as close as possible, but it, it's going to be difficult to make students realize that this is not business as usual. This is going to be a completely different semester, a different school year. Um, and, and students, you know, quite frankly, aren't realizing that right now. So we need to, you know, set the standard as soon as possible. Uh, we need to lay down the law um, or lay down the law. We need to, I, I, I don't know how we go about this, but we need to tell every student, we need to kind of, you know, lead a social media campaign or how we're going to go about it and say, students actually have to wear masks. This isn't just about you. This is the Carolina community you're talking about, people who are immunocompromised and people who are, you know, at risk. And students just, a lot of them aren't realizing that right now, unfortunately. Okay, so there's work to do there. And Bob, did you have a follow-up? I just wanted to reinforce uh, the expectation. Um, as I think most people know, the, the, the governor right now is considering uh, having mask wearing required, you know, in, across the state of North Carolina. Uh, Orange County has uh, implemented a mask requirement rule uh, when one cannot preserve the six foot social distancing or physical distancing along with any uh, one going into a building uh, would be required. And, and many of those uh, parallel our community standards. And, and so uh, it, is, it is absolutely essential that uh, everyone accept that mask wearing is critical. And to uh, Reese's point, um, you know, in terms of people wanting exceptions, um, there will be um, uh, accommodation for uh, religious or health exceptions, but there's a process by which students would have to go through in order for that to be honored. And so I just want, I want everyone to know that people just cannot self-declare uh, that they uh, are not going to wear a mask for a particular reason. There would be a validation process that goes. So it's similar to what is currently done. We're not making any changes in terms of the current conduct of uh, expectations in terms of declaring uh, an exception. Thank you. I'm sure that will come up again. And I think we have um, some other questions and panelists uh, that will speak to that a little also a little later. I don't think we Oh, Gerald, did you have? Nope. Okay. I mean, with regard to that, I mean, we were on a call earlier today with student affairs. And so we're looking at how uh, gatherings this fall will have to be uh, smaller gatherings, whether it's a limit of 25 uh, outdoors it is right now, that may change over the course of the, um, the next several months, but uh, Greek life will have to be different uh, than, than what it has been in the past. To Reeve's point earlier, uh, it's, it's going to be a semester that looks and feels very different than any other fall semester in the history of our university. And, I'm just optimistic that we'll be able to work with these student groups and uh, uh, Desiree Rickenberg, who's part of our team, Jonathan Sauls and uh, and others uh, are working hard to try to put in place the uh, what those uh, guidelines or restrictions are going to look like. I, I just want to reemphasize the importance of mask wearing and maybe ask Dr. Weber, you know, to maybe make a comment. Uh, m most people have in the past thought of mask wearing as being only of benefit to the other person. Uh, but there's a lot of new evidence that would suggest that mask wearing is a benefit to both parties, the wearer as well as the other party. And so Dr. Weber, maybe you could just um, shed some additional insight into that. Absolutely. Uh, so first of all, that we know that if an infected person is wearing a mask, it uh, dramatically limits the number of expelled infectious particles. So they are providing a public health and to me a crucial benefit to people in their vicinity. And we know if you're wearing a mask and you're near somebody who happens to be infectious with without a mask, it's highly protective for you. Uh, at the hospital, we've taken care of many, many patients, well over 100 patients now with COVID. And we have fully protected our healthcare providers by having all our visitors, all our patients, and all our staff always wearing a mask. So this is the most crucial thing we can do along with uh, physical uh, uh, distancing. And I prefer the term physical distancing. We want you to stay socially uh, connected. And you're providing a direct benefit to you. And I should say, well, younger people are less likely to become seriously ill. There are many young people who don't, uh, who have serious disease uh, from COVID and unfortunately some, uh, uh, some deaths as well. And you're providing a critical public health benefit 
to people in your vicinity because we know people can be asymptomatically infected and we know people can be pre-symptomatic, that is uh, not develop symptoms for a, a few days, but still be uh, highly infectious. I'm going to follow up on that and just ask my own question right now. And that is, um, what's, do we have to be perfect? I mean, what's the level of perfection required to, to keep our campus safe with these practices? So oh, again, you know, uh, the goal here is that everybody, all times, when they're outside of a private office or uh, a dorm room, wear a mask when they're in public with other people. To the extent that uh, uh, a persons are not doing that and or not physically distancing, particularly the mask is most important. We're putting people at risk, and the answer is the more that occurs, the uh, the higher the risk. Uh, we know from our testing of uh, people before procedures that about one in 200 people are asymptomatically infected, but that may be a higher risk group than we would see otherwise. And you can't look at somebody and see whether they're asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. So it's critical that we do this uh, at all times. Thank you. All right, uh, for contact tracing, how will information about potential exposure be shared how will the campus be notified when there are positive cases? And then the rules will not work as expected because humans make mistakes and don't follow the rules as robots. Imagine there is one COVID-19 sh case showing up in a face-to-face -face classroom. By the time the student is tested, others will be infected. So I think I just got to my own question here on this slide with the level of compliance needed. And then what happens in a face-to-face -face class if there is a positive case? Does the whole class move into quarantine? What happens at that point? Oh, Kathy Brennan. Yes, so um, in terms of contact tracing, you look at who's a close contact, and there's a C CDC and a state definition for that. And it means you have to have been within six feet of the positive individual for more than 15 minutes. Um, so when we do contact tracing, you know, we are specifically asking that positive case where they have been, who has been near them that meets that definition. Um, so in some cases in a classroom, uh, you know, not the whole classroom would be considered a close contact. Um, but we do look at very specific things. Each case is different. And we always coordinate with um, the local health department, the Orange County Health Department, for guidance about who's considered a close contact. Yesterday at a meeting, uh, Kathy and Ken and, 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 and our um, uh, uh, roadmap uh, working group had the con this conversation. Uh, and we also talked about uh, if, if you are inside that six foot distance, but everybody is wearing a mask, uh, would contact tracing uh, still be required? And we're actually looking into that um, at, at this moment. The, the general feeling was that probably not, uh, that, uh, you know, it, that, that probably that, that case um, would, would not have, have, have spread uh, because everybody was adhering to the mask, uh, the mask rule. But we are going to uh, continue to talk about this and uh, engage the uh, Orange County Public Health Department as well as some of our experts to see whether they all would concur you know, with that. Anybody else on that question? What happens in a follow-up? Oh, okay. The one about face-to-face -face class. Well, I think that's what they were speaking to, is that if you were within this radius, okay. it, you might not. The, the positive would be isolated. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that comes to the end of, the, of this set of comments um, and questions that came from the survey this time. Um, we may, should we do this again? We'll pull in some more and bring in other issues, but I think other issues are going to come up um, in, in our next segment. I did want to welcome um, Kia Caldwell into the conversation. She's on Zoom, and I believe she is presenting a roadmap for equity that she would like to share at this point. Yes, Kia? thank you. Hi. Oops. Hi. Hi there. Sorry about that. Hopefully you can hear me and see me here. Um, so I just wanted to thank Lloyd and 
the FEC leadership um, for inviting me to, um, so to speak, on behalf of faculty of color and indigenous faculty um, in my role as co-facilitator of the IH's faculty of color and indigenous faculty group along with Heidi Kim. And it is Juneteenth. I, I missed all of Lloyd's comments earlier. Um, you know, our, our country is now beginning to focus more on Juneteenth and the signif its significance as Emancipation Day. I do think it's important for us to be having these, these conversations and for our roadmap um, to racial equity, which faculty of color, black faculty and indigenous faculty have written um, and which will circulate on Monday um, for this to be discussed and um, for us to really think about what emancipation and racial equity mean. And the fact that there's still incomplete processes and projects in our country, on our campus and in our world. And I um, first came to the, fac uh, the faculty executive committee a couple of weeks ago because of wellness concerns, um, mental health concerns for black faculty in particular, but faculty of color given the pandemic, but also because of the ongoing racial violence and trauma that um, so many black people are experiencing. And being faculty doesn't make us immune to that trauma, that grief, and those of us who study it, in some ways it's compounded. I also just wanted to echo what Jim Thomas said on Monday about the fact that we're not all in the same boat. We're, we're all in the same storm as he, I think eloquently said, but we are in different boats and there's no singular Carolina or UNC experience. And that's particularly, particularly true for faculty of historically underrepresented groups as well as our, as our students and staff from historically underrepresented groups. Also, Mimi mentioned trust um, earlier, and I think that's really critical in this time um, when we do have to pull together as a university, but trust in our leadership um, is has been broken multiple times. And so it, it is hard to, to put faith in uh, our leadership for many faculty of color, and that's what I'm hearing. I'm also hearing that people are exhausted um, I think we're all exhausted given the pandemic and national um, sort of dynamics around race right now. Um, but this is particularly true for faculty of color. I'll just use that, that sort of blanket term. And uh, when we look at the impact of COVID-19 disproportionately on our communities, look at police violence, look at um, issues around immigration. And this has led to chronic stress and an extremely unhealthy sort of um, living context, right? Well-being context for many of us. And there also were toxic racial dynamics and a toxic racial climate um, on our campus, even pre-COVID. So we really would like for our leadership and our faculty colleagues to think about these things and to think about ways that our campus can move forward. This is a transformative time, whether or not we were ready for the pandemic. And it's a way, and it's a time in which our university is being rethought as an institution. Um, so we really would like to see racial equity be placed at the center of all decision-making for um, historically underrepresented faculty to have a seat at the multiple tables where decisions are being made. We would certainly like to see more faculty of color in positions of leadership and again, decision-making as well. And I will just read sort of the preamble to our um, roadmap and then we can share more about it next week. So in light of ongoing racial challenges with regard to racial equity and institutional racism at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the undersigned faculty have developed this roadmap for racial equity to guide future decision and policy making at the university. Though this document focuses on faculty concerns, we are in solidarity with all Carolina workers seeking a more equitable and inclusive workplace. We want to acknowledge the precariousness of the many employees that are vulnerable and unable to speak out. As the oldest public university in the nation, UNC Chapel Hill has a deeply rooted history of participation in racially discriminatory practices including the occupation of native land, enslavement, and racial segregation. 
that have led to systemic and institutionalized racial privileges for some and inequities for others. We believe now is the time for decisive and swift action to change the culture and policies of the university. We invite the university leadership and our faculty colleagues to stand and work with us to make UNC Chapel Hill a more equitable and inclusive campus where all can succeed and thrive. And uh, one of our first um, requests or calls is for the establishment of faculty advisory groups on racial equity, community and belonging by the chancellor and the provost that will meet with senior leadership on a monthly basis. And as someone who's been involved in this work for a while, um, there is a pattern of faculty of color requesting meetings with our administration. And so we really would like to see a shift where our administrators are inviting us to meet with them and make a commitment to ongoing conversations with us. And I do thank the faculty executive committee um, for again, making this space and we look forward to working with you as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for calling us all to this action. This is critically important. I think there are many people that want to join with you in this, um, in this work and, and I'm one of them. So I, I wanna be, do everything that I can to support this work going forward. At, I will turn it can to we, Lloyd. Can we ask if, uh, does Melinda Lowry also want to make a statement about this? Melinda on the call. I am. I am. I am here. Um, I just could add briefly some of the results that we received when we were surveyed faculty of color, indigenous faculty, and black faculty. Um, some of their comments have been along the lines of questions in the chat and things that have been addressed already today. But I'll just add a few more specifics and perhaps a directed question or two that would would help people understand our circumstances a bit better. Um, there have been concerns raised about adjunct faculty of color, how in many departments, the only faculty of color are adjuncts. And we would like to see um, better or in any way more detail uh, provided about their particular circumstances under an increased budget crisis that is immediately apparent. Um, people would also like to see broadly addressed um, in terms specific to faculty of color, indigenous faculty and black faculty, that um, the disproportionate effect of COVID-19 on our community members. We are not um, only members of UNC Chapel Hill. We all take deep risks when we come to campus and we, when we expose ourselves to, the, to um, this virus. And as one of our participants eloquently said, uh, we ask that you not exacerbate our circumstances by forcing us to take risks our communities cannot afford. If this were only a matter of my risk of being infected, I would be more than willing to take the risk. And this faculty member is a member of an indigenous community. But as indigenous people, we are connected to our lands and our families and a risk to us is a risk to them as well. I think even though this person was speaking from an indigenous perspective, that's an articulation that I have heard widely from members of this working group, as well as faculty across campus, whether they identify as members of underrepresented minorities on this campus or not. Um, we're not unconnected to many people who are already, data has already shown us our disproportionate risk um, to not only contracting the virus, but also to dying from the virus. We, don't wanna make that worse. This is not about us as individuals and protecting our safety on campus. When we are asked to make sacrifices, we wanna know precisely what the risks are that we're expected to um, accommodate. And in particular, I think some, some people have asked this on the chat. We've been asking for this information, most of us for weeks. What is the target number or percentage of students, faculty and staff of infections, hospitalization, and death that the implementation experts are expecting with the plan that they have developed. What is the target number or percentage of students, faculty, and staff that your planning scenarios are expecting? We want to know the answer to that question so that we can evaluate the degree of risk we're taking when we come back to campus. 
the second question that stems, I think, from these comments is that an email from the chancellor last week said that an evidence-based diversity, equity, and inclusion crisis action strategy was in place to guide the response to COVID-19 on our campus. What are the components of that strategy? And specifically, how has it influenced the roadmap? I'll stop there, thank you. Um, do any of our panelists, before I turn it over to Lloyd, do, does anyone want to address anything that uh, Dr. Lowry brought up? Uh, this is Dr. Weber. I, I will say that the, the speaker is exactly right. This has taken COVID a disproportionately uh, uh, burden on uh, uh, both uh, Latinos and uh, people of color. There's no question about that. We've seen it in our own uh, hospitalizations. Uh, this is related to social, economic, other issues. We're not aware of any uh, ethnic uh, predisposition to this. It's also related to a lack of health care, underlying medical conditions, uh, and access to health care. Uh, certainly, uh, I can only speak here for the medical center. We've tried to address some of these uh, by having a roving van that does provide testing, and that van has been, instead of having people come into our respiratory diagnostic centers, this van is going to them uh, to help uh, test those individuals, and they visited a number of uh, areas, and I should say, the testing has shown a disproportionately high percentage of people in those areas are, are positive. And then to uh, the extent we can, we've provided obviously referrals to social services as well as to medical uh, areas for treatment of those, uh, those individuals. Uh, I would say though, in terms of safety, uh, you know, we can, uh, with the plans we have for the campus, protect people on campus if people have our off campus, obviously they need to follow the same guidelines and that's certainly a risk to, uh, uh, to, uh, to individuals, but certainly within the hospital, despite taking care of many COVID positive people, we've been able following uh, the rules that we've talked about, uh, having people stay home if they're ill, uh, uh, wearing masks and physical distancing. We've been able to protect our healthcare providers. And I should say, I mean broadly all of our healthcare providers. I'm not, we've not focused on physicians or nurses only. We want to protect our environmental service workers, our social workers, our groundskeepers, our police, and we've been successful in doing that. And Dr. Alexander. Yes, I'm, I'm going to affirm the statements uh, being made. Those are the ones I have been hearing as well and over the past couple of weeks have raised uh, consistently at our meetings. And what uh, I think is being addressed is a real understanding of how collectivist cultures operate and function. And uh, which Melinda, I think, spoke to very eloquently. And the bottom line is none of the people I've talked to or their biggest concern is they don't want to make anybody else sick. They don't want the guilt of that or the guilt of killing their mom, grandmother, auntie, whomever. And so the stress psychologically around that, even if I'm okay, if I have somehow out of my being in spaces have brought something to others whom I care about, then uh, now I carry the guilt of that, which brings its own psychological pieces to it. So I'm hearing that. I'm also hearing uh, concerns about uh, uh, an increasing gap, uh, achievement gap for students uh, because of uh, circumstances that are often not of their own making, but they're real in terms of uh, having the tools and equipment and uh, being able to learn in a completely online environment, if you will, uh, when that has happened. And to this extent, how far they may even feel like they've already been placed behind. There are equity questions around admissions and what's gonna happen to the numbers there in terms of what our demographics look like. Um, and then there are concerns around uh, disparities as well in time to promotion, tenure, um, or, and, and those issues, workload, 
these continue to be the issues that uh, I'm hearing also. So uh, I just wanted to add to what the two speakers have said and I think have framed well. I think it may show up in the map that uh, Kia is talking about, but I did want to put them before the group here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me just, if I may, first of all, I, I appreciate and respect the uh, comments that uh, have been made uh, by Kia and Melinda. And uh, Ramey, I want to thank you for your tireless efforts over the years, uh, working closely with the leadership team on these important issues, and and also acknowledge uh, Sibby Anderson Tompkins, who's done an incredible job over the past three and a half, four months. She stepped into her role as Chief Diversity Officer on uh, 20, uh, February 24th, just a few weeks before COVID-19 set in. Uh, as you know, Sibby uh, co-signed that letter last week that Bob and I put out regarding uh, issues around uh, diversity and inclusion and response to the unrest uh, across the country and how uh, we were reacting and responding and putting uh, an action plan in place. Uh, the COVID-19 DEI uh, crisis action strategy that Melinda referenced, uh, that guide uh, was developed by Dr. Damon Williams at the University of Wisconsin, and uh, it's been adopted. Uh, Sibby's using it uh, and putting, putting it uh, into our action plan. The components of that are, uh, it's really allowing us to view COVID-19 through the lens of our underrepresented um, community members and around cultural relevant decision-making, supporting diverse communities, uh, digitizing inclusive ev evidence, and uh, uh, communicating thoughtfully and inclusively. And I know Sibby can speak to this better than I can, but I think it was important that we adopted this uh, as many other universities have. I also want to say that, going back to something earlier that uh, Kia said, uh, I just want to remind people that our strategic plan, Carolina Next Innovations for Public Good, was launched on January 30th. The first of the eight strategic initiatives in that plan is called Build Our Community Together. We placed, that's the only initiative that we said needed to be ranked in any order. It's the first of the eight. The other seven could have been put in any order because we said if we don't get that right, we uh, we can't accomplish these other seven initiatives. Uh, we are committed to this. Amy Locklear Hotel and Sibby and uh, several other uh, others have been leading that effort even over these past four months during COVID-19 and making great progress. Um, Sibby and Amy and I also had a conversation, a very heartfelt conversation the other day over Zoom with Alan O'Barr, who, uh, as you know, leads our uh, counseling and psychological services down at, student, at Campus Health. And we talked uh, about the challenges that our underrepresented members uh, of our campus community, especially our students, are, are dealing with, the mental health toll on, on this and many of the issues that, that were just discussed. And we are committed to this and we're uh, amplifying the services that CAPS can provide. We've hired additional counselors over this uh, uh, the past few weeks to help address these needs. So we are focused on this. We are going to show uh, action with regard to this so that every member of this campus community feels protected and that they uh, can uh, that they belong here and, and can thrive at Carolina. Having said that, Bob and I and, and others on the team have said repeatedly, we, we know that not every member of our campus community is going to be able to come back this fall. Uh, we want to provide that opportunity for those who uh, feel they can do that safely and be here and thrive and feel safe being here and, and we're going to continue to work on a plan that that does that such that when people do arrive here uh, they are going to um, that they will feel safe and, and can thrive uh, at Carolina. Turn it over to you. Okay thank thank you Melinda and Kia and uh, so this um, evidence-based uh, diversity uh, action strategy is also part of this ongoing roadmap. Is that correct? And uh, I think the specific question, the components of that strategy that you alluded to is, is partly what um, Melinda wants to explore further. So I think we should come back to that. Is that correct, Melinda? Yes, it is. Thank you. And then I know there's still uncertainty about the other question Melinda asked, which had to do with the specific numbers, which 
I, I think we've addressed as part of the off-ramp issue, what would those numbers look like and, and when would they come into effect? Is that correct? I also work with, yes, I also work with staff, of course, as a center director. Um, chairs and faculty members have been asking for that data for three, four weeks, maybe longer. We'd like uh, to know. I think I think that's something we're going to need to come back to, and I don't know if, if David Weber and his team are going to be able to provide more on that as well, but specific numbers of what would trigger heightened concern. Um, do you have any response to Melinda's question about that? You know, I don't know that we can give a, uh, a specific uh, number uh, there. There are many parameters that would certainly to the extent we see increased uh, increases in the surrounding community, our campus, uh, faculty, students, uh, staff need to practice the same things we're going to be doing on the campus, outside of the campus. And certainly within our hospital, we've seen uh, our employees uh, turn positive and develop COVID, but that's overwhelmingly from community exposure. So we need to make sure that we're practicing uh, that. We can come up with, I think, a variety of general guidelines, uh, uh, but I don't know that we can put a specific uh, number on it because it's balancing many factors, uh, ability of uh, campus health to see patients, uh, uh, the ability to do contact uh, tracing, uh, potential outbreaks that involve groups of students or faculty. I don't know that we can put a specific number on it. I'm sensing this is one of the uh, tension points between what many faculty and students are looking, graduate students also may be looking for those specific numbers and the ability of our leadership team to provide that kind of target. But I, I wanna come back to those issues, uh, but I think we need to move on now to some other committee leadership. Uh, we ask, uh, and I wanna thank Melinda and Kia again for their, their contributions and Rume as well. And we're gonna come back to this at the FEC meeting again on Monday. Um, so I wanna ask a couple of uh, questions. I think the committee leaders are now in the room with us. Is that correct? And I, I wanted to begin by asking, uh, is Dan Anderson on the call? Uh, he, he is not on the call. Um, so let me, let me go to a related question then, I believe from Ann Gilliland. Is Ann, could, Ann, could you pose the question you had raised about, uh, this is, Ann is the chair of the Copyright Committee of Faculty Governance, and Ann has some questions about copyright issues. Could you just formulate that question for us? I'd be glad to. So, um, as we move to a situation where more and more people are teaching either online completely or in a blended fashion, um, there are more and more, um, I guess what you, I would call uh, artifacts of uh, lectures and other uh, materials that are developed that can be reused. Um, normally, and in, in, you know, back in the days before the pandemic, um, teacher, faculty owned their, the works that they, met, that they used in the classroom for instruction uh, in the, in the, generally. But the university uh, had the ability and, and asserted a license to reuse those works if possible. So this would be things like syllabi, lecture notes, et cetera. Um, given the emergency that we're in now, there's been some concern that uh, perhaps uh, a faculty member will devise uh, materials for learning online, uh, record lectures and so on. And then the university might in the future uh, with you know, what will probably be some significant budget pressures going forward, uh, want to reuse that material without um, employing uh, full-time tenure line faculty to, to teach those classes and to, to use some of those materials that had been uh, created in order to sort of um, uh, reduce the costs of delivering the education in the future. Uh, so we have had some requests from faculty about considering some sort of assurance or perhaps a waiver of that policy during this period to allay faculty concerns about that. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Anne. Does anyone want to respond to this issue of copyright control over online course materials? Yeah, Bob. This is Bob Lewin. Um, the university would not do that. Um, we, the, the university would not uh, utilize uh, the, a lecture that a faculty uh, created uh, in their voice and their presence uh, and, uh, and their uh, slides or other core materials and, uh, and, and reuse them without that faculty member's participation. Um, and now, there are situations where a faculty member might leave, and one of the reasons why the university wants to make sure that they have the, the, the rights you know, to that material so that uh, the department that has the responsibility of that course can continue to um, easily transition uh, to the next individual who would have the responsibility of teaching that and potentially using uh, some of the content. But we certainly would not be reusing a video of a faculty member giving a lecture but with, without their permission. Thank you. Thank you. So that's important. And that's also an ongoing con conversation. And I, I want to turn next to Shana Hill, the chair of the employee forum, because I want faculty also to hear Shana's uh, concerns as a representative of our colleagues and, and the staff. Shana, what, what comments or questions would you add to this community conversation? Hi, everybody. Thank you um, for uh, inviting me and allowing me to share my thoughts. Um, staff tend to live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, and that brings on a whole unique set of stresses. We are, um, we are a group of people who have uh, our feeling is that we were forgotten in the raise process last year. We were already stressed. We're already in areas where we are working in skeletal crews. We're understaffed. And then we were asked to switch gears very, very quickly and transform operations to remote. And this caused yet another level of stress. I have to say that I've never seen such amazing teamwork. People have pulled together. People have made things happen that we never thought would happen, given the time frame that we had. They really pulled together and did incredible things. And we want this to work. We really, really want this to work. Then we were given an accelerated timeline for absolutely everything to happen, given that we're bringing students in earlier. Then we were given another level of stress to add reporting so that we could get some funding back. And it goes on and on and on and on. And we're still hopeful. We want to make this work. We want to be supportive. We want to exemplify the, the talents that we have and make this successful. But coming into an accelerated time frame where we're starting early and we're finishing early, we're worried. The pace has been unsustainable. And many of us, in order to make this work, will not have that restorative vacation break coming into this. We're nervous, we're ridden with anxiety, we're afraid we'll fail, we're afraid that you won't hear how desperate we are to be, to be cared for. We hear a lot about how we need to be patient with students and give a wide berth and how wonderful faculty are. But we feel like we're being missed in the conversation. We want you to understand how hard we're working. We want you to understand how much of our heart is in it. But many of us will not be restored coming into this. And we ask for your patience and your grace and your understanding. When we went to phase two in North Carolina, a lot of 
a lot of things are happening that you may not be aware of. I personally know people who are being evicted. My mother-in-law is in a long-term healthcare facility. She may die without me getting a chance to say goodbye. These are the things that your North Carolina UNC family community are dealing with. We want to stand with you, but we want you to stand with us too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think you've raised a really important point because as faculty, we've talked a lot about our own uh, teaching concerns and our own priorities of how we're going to manage this. And we're very aware of students, but we have to be very sensitive to the price that staff are paying to make all this happen. And uh, I, I take your point also about the mental health consequences of all of this. I think that's, that's an ongoing issue. So we wanted to make sure that our faculty are thinking of that issue. Does, does anyone have any response to Shana's comments? Do you want to say anything, Kevin, about this and the faculty staff relationship that she talked about? Uh, thank you. Your, your leadership has been uh, really uh, vital to us, uh, Shana, during this time. I enjoyed meeting with the faculty, uh, with the employee forum a few weeks ago. And, uh, and hearing their voices and uh, trying to respond to some of the concerns, as, as many of the concerns as we can at that time that, that they had. I have said that um, you know, UNC Chapel Hill never really shut down during this pandemic. We, we, we have not shut down. I keep talking about this is not a reopening of the university. It's a, a ramping up of on-campus operations because our employees have been showing up every day at Carolina. Granted, the vast majority of them remotely. And, uh, and working probably harder than they ever have for all the things you've just said. So uh, thank you. And I enjoyed having the opportunity to speak to the employee forum a few weeks ago. Uh, and there are a lot of people who have been here on our campus working hard. I mean, Bob and I were on a call this morning with members of our leadership team. Uh, Kathy was on that call, uh, uh, David was, where we uh, heard from, from Darius, who, who uh, is uh, leading that effort with our uh, facilities team checking all the ventilation and all the buildings on campus he has a team doing that and uh, Daryl is leading those calls in the morning I, I, you're sitting behind Bob there and uh, listening to the, the extra efforts of our housekeepers our groundskeepers that are keeping the, the campus looking beautiful during these times so uh, people are showing up every day either remotely or, or here on campus to try to create an environment uh, a safe environment for our return so thank you. Could I, could I follow up on that? One of the recurring concerns is ventilation in buildings where staff work, where people teach. Could someone speak about, maybe Daryl or, or maybe David, about ventilation, concerns about the virus circulating into offices through ventilation systems that would affect staff? Yeah, David. Let me start with the, uh, with the science. So. Uh, there's no question that this virus is in the air. It's uh, spread as respiratory viruses are by expelled droplets of someone who's sick and then somebody who is uh, nearby uh, breathing them in. That's the major way it's spread. That said and done, what really determines how uh, the distance it can travel to cause infection depends on uh, many other, many factors. It depends on wind. The virus doesn't survive as well at high temperatures and, uh, and humidities. As distance goes up, the uh, air volume goes up as a cube function. Uh, UV light uh, damages the virus, it dries out. Uh, so there are many factors. And then uh, we need to know, uh, in addition, you need to have an infecting dose. So you need a certain amount of viruses to inhale. All the evidence that we've seen suggests that this is a relatively short distance virus, meaning uh, less than uh, six feet. Uh, at most, in fact, the WHO says it's uh, physical distancing can be uh, essentially one meter between three and four feet. Uh, there are other viruses, chickenpox, tuberculosis, or uh, bacteria tuberculosis, uh, that uh, go long distances uh, where we can have a person in one room and people down the hall in other rooms can acquire diseases. Measles is the same way. That has not been demonstrated with uh, this disease. We don't see it in our hospital. We, as you know, we have millions of people around the world infected. Uh, we have not seen that in other hospitals where a person in, in uh, one room is infecting people in corridors or down the room. So we do believe that it is a short distance to become uh, infected, which is what we base our physical distancing on. 
So that's somewhat reassuring for those of us who work in uh, spaces of classrooms and offices. Even in this room, I just started thinking about this. Take a deep breath, we're okay, you're saying. Okay, so let me move to another question. Or um, I wanted to ask um, Melinda Beck, is Melinda on the call? Yes. Melinda I had uh, some questions. She's the chair of the L Educational Policy Committee and there were several questions submitted. Um, Melinda, could you focus on what you think is most important from your committee? Yeah, a couple of them have already been answered. So I'll just focus on the ones that <clears throat> we would like addressed. Um, one of them is if we have to close again in the middle of the semester, has thought been given to support students who may not have adequate broadband? So be able to meet those classes remotely. Um, another question is if all of our classes are required to have a remote option as per the roadmap, and can students just select the remote option for any reason? So the, the question is then if we're offering mass to mass or high flex and students don't have to come, I mean, do we know, if, have students been surveyed, are they actually going to come into a classroom when they have a remote option? And the other question we'd like addressed is where are students expected to go between classes if non-classroom spaces have limited capacity? So where can they go to be socially distanced uh, between courses. Could someone answer either of those questions? So, uh, Melinda, I'll, I'll take the first question regarding the potential need to pivot uh, at some point in the semester. Uh, we were able to do that very quickly back in March, and we were able to uh, help students in need that didn't have uh, the ability to, with the internet service and broadband at home. Uh, we. <laughs> Uh, we're in a much better place today than we were then. A, having been through it, we know how to respond to it, but we have resources to do it. We have uh, federal funding, we, our COVID-19 relief uh, CARES funding. That's exactly what it is uh, for, it's to help our students. Uh, uh, and so we're, we're in a much better place to be able to do that um, than we were in March. And what about the other question of where students go between, oh, Bob, yeah. I'll try the, uh, the other two questions. Um, so students uh, will, will be asked uh, whether or not they are opting to the remote educational mode. And the reason why they will be asked that is because uh, their own um, fees might be dependent upon whether or not they are uh, residing on campus or going to be in, in experiencing um, the, the, the campus life, campus community, or that they will be treated as a, as a remote student. And so there, there is that um, consideration. However, um, we also are asking uh, faculty to uh, do their very best to develop their courses so that they all have a remote option to them uh, in the event that a student um, cannot make it to class um, or, or might be in quarantine or, or, or in isolation. Um, so we, we, we are going to ask faculty uh, to, to be flexible with our students and to accommodate uh, those students um, as, as, as much as they can, as much as, as is uh, reasonable. And then I think the question uh, about where do students go uh, in between classes, I think that's a great question and, and not an easy question to, to answer. Um, we have been looking into um, some flexible um, adaptive spaces outside. Um, and, and we have begun to map out uh, in terms of a, a lot of our uh, free spaces, green spaces, uh, the use of tents uh, and other forms of uh, places where students and faculty could go to, uh, assuming uh, everyone would, would still uh, uh, appropriately physical distance and, 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 and have masks on as well. Uh, we're also looking at bathroom facilities, and we know that in between classes, that's a, a common uh, spot, and maybe uh, creating alternative additional uh, bathroom facilities uh, uh, through flexible um, bathroom facilities across the campus and strategically locating them where they had, would have maximum value. Okay. Uh, Bob, could I, could I just do a quick follow-up to the question about uh, remote access for students? So, if a student choose, comes to campus and is planning to, to go to class, you know, mask to mask, and then chooses later to go remotely, do, do they have to give me a reason or can they just, you know, not show up and now they're doing it remotely? So, I mean, what, what, what's the 
my job as a faculty member for students who decide to switch to going remotely after they're on campus. This is, this is Abigail Panter. I thought I would answer that one. Um, if you're doing a face-to-face -face hybrid course um, and a student is in that course, that student has the expectation to be in that course and is not a remote student. If for some reason a student needs to become a remote student, just like in every other situation that you have in your class, that will be an accommodation that a instructor will be able to make at that point and then choose to um, accommodate the student. But a face-to-face -face hybrid course, the expectation is there will not be a remote student from the start, and that will be stated in this syllabus. If after something, after the semester begins, the instructor chooses to accommodate the student for some reason, for whatever reason it will be, that's the instructor that will be between the student and the instructor. Thank you. So that that's an ongoing uh, process, but it could change then during a semester dependent on the, the student's situation, I think. Um, Melinda, I think we, we're going to move on to another question. Uh, Rume, you you've had you talked about some other issues. You had a question about uh, faculty, staff, and students with disabilities. Do, do have we? Do you want to just follow up briefly on that one as well? I'm holding it. Yeah, it's green. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. I'll just talk a little louder. Um, the sense is they don't see themselves in the picture. And uh, we're trying to understand exactly how and where, if that has occurred, they can find it or how has that been talked about or addressed, given that they uh, have specific needs, uh, including even some of the disinfectants and things we use could certainly exacerbate some of the allergies and reactions to that extent. So um, I don't know if anybody can answer that. Uh, and it's I wonder about sense. just the circulation in and out of buildings is going to change and how would that, I don't know, Kathy, is there any specific consideration on uh, faculty, staff, and students with special needs that Rume has described. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the EOC has been involved in a lot of the discussions. Um, I haven't been on those specific working groups, but I do know, know those discussions are occurring. So I don't know if others have more information about that. We, we can't hear you, I think, but there's new information on the roadmap about these issues. The roadmap is being updated all the time. Um, we have not, uh, as of yet, addressed all of the issues that, that you're raising. I think the one that we have talked a lot about are uh, visual disabilities uh, and hearing disabilities. Um, and uh, particularly if, uh, if the choice uh, of the student would be remote, uh, that there would be a series of, of questions and accommodations that we would need to apply there. Uh, and also, if, if students were to um, uh, choose residential, uh, we do have some students who have hearing disabilities and they uh, read lips. Uh, and so uh, obviously, this is not a very good mechanism for individuals who, who require lip reading. And so we are looking at alternative face masks and alternative accommodations uh, for them. Um, we, we have not really addressed any other uh, unique uh, uh, that would perhaps be outside of the uh, uh, EOC's Office of, of Declaration of uh, Accommodation for Disabilities. Uh, and, and so if there are, uh, for example, uh, allergies to uh, certain chemicals known to be disinfectants, that, that would be very important for us to know. And we would do our very best to uh, accommodate those in terms of either uh, uh, removing them from those environments or, or seeking some professional help to see whether or not there was an alternative disinfectant that could be used. Have you received um, from our disability office uh, guidelines that they have that have come from their national organization that makes some recommendations? Have you seen those? 
Uh, I, I have not, but uh, I think that's a great point, and I, I'll, I'll just, uh, Daryl uh, and I will uh, add that to our list of uh, things to inquire about and find out whether or not they have any explicit new guidance, you know, based on the COVID-19 that we should be considering. So thank you for that suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. I want to go next to the chair of the faculty research uh, committee, Gary Kudebeck, who's actually, Gary's in the room with us. And he has a question. Thanks, Lloyd. Um, so this is uh, related to some of the issues we've been talking about and, and focused some on cost benefit analysis. So are costs of uh, full university operations being weighed against the cost of starting things and then needing to suppress operations because of infection versus maybe going virtually for departments or across campus. So, and even decisions like uh, starting the football program up um, and, you know, what if we need to, to uh, suspend that due to infection? So what information is out there and how can units on campus be informed as they think about their strategies for resuming full operations? We talked uh, in our, we've been talking about this in terms of the competing interests and values that everything that's being considered here is we're trying to make uh, the, the safest decision about a return to campus. And uh, I've said over and over that we know that our students learn and grow in different ways and that what we hear from them and their parents is that they, uh, they learn and grow best when they're on campus here and they thrive when they're here. And to do that, we're trying to bring uh, as many of those courses, uh, you know, to be taught here on campus. I, as I said earlier, we know that we're not going to be able to bring everybody back, so we're trying to create those flexibilities. But we do know that students uh, want to come back here and en enroll to, to learn on campus in a residential environment. And if they're going to uh, not have that opportunity and everything, they're going to come back here and everything's going to be remote, that there, many of them have said that they will um, either defer, uh, take a gap year, et cetera. Uh, as Bob, I think, indicated at one of the last uh, FEC meetings, uh, the numbers are simple. It's for about every 10% of, of students who would choose not to enroll, defer, uh, that it's in the neighborhood of about $50 million. Uh, there is an additional probably $25 million on top of that if they are, uh, if for every 10% that are residential students living in residence halls and dining plans, et cetera. So those are factors. Those are dollars that pay for our operations, for our employees, our faculty, salary so we're, we we know that we're there will be some lost revenue from tuition uh, but for every 10 percent i mean multiply that out to if 40 percent 50 percent chose not to come back uh, weigh that against what is going to cost to get our campus up and running uh, those expenses are estimated in the uh, roughly 40 million dollar range and but a lot of that is to ramp up our research operations. So it's not just about the delivery of instruction, but a, a large part of it is. So uh, we're, we're going to need uh, to to balance all that. Uh, there are financial uh, implications here. We have to think about the financial health of the institution and the financial health of our employees. Uh, we are doing everything possible to protect the core mission of this university and uh, and our people who make that <laughs> mission uh, run every day. So, um, or who allow us to carry out that mission. With respect to athletics, uh, yes, there's a major, there, there are a few sports that clearly bring in the bulk of the revenue for athletics. And uh, those are ones that, you know, that revenue comes through both uh, receipts for, you know, ticket sales and concessions and, uh, and all that on game day, but it's also about the TV revenue. So playing uh, games uh, in the absence of fans still brings in, in a significant amount of revenue, assuming those TV contracts are still in place and all indications are that they would. Uh, again, having said that, above all else is the health and safety of our uh, campus community, and that includes those student athletes. If it's not safe for them to be out there uh, practicing and playing, then w we will pull the pull it. And I, I just had a we're having meetings regularly with the ACC presidents uh, and uh, chancellors, and every uh, all 15 of those schools are dealing with the same challenges that we are. 
It's happening across the country. So uh, the revenue is a is a big part of it. Bob, I don't know if you would add. So if we lost 20% of our student enrollment, we could lose $100 million plus auxiliary money. And this is, I mean, I'm just thinking of the possible impact on staff as well as faculty positions at that point, including fixed term positions that we've talked about. Do you want to say anything about the budget issue that no, Gary is? I was just going to comment, you know, at one of our previous meetings, I think it was the, uh, the at the FPC, um, uh, it was recommended to Kevin and myself to uh, meet with some of our campus ethicists. And we posed that question to them because it, it really, um, or in fact, they raised that issue in terms of this uh, concept of uh, balancing values, you know, and uh, uh, and and how how do you balance uh, health against um, uh, educational opportunities for students, uh, research opportunities for faculty, uh, economic losses that would come, and then the consequences of those economic losses in the form of faculty jobs or 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 staff jobs or or graduate student jobs, and so they they just advise us to make sure that we always keep the full balance in play as we think about the, the, the probabilities. And, and that's one of the reasons why people like Dr. Weber are so critical to us because, you know, if, if, the, if the risk is, is relatively low, then and, and we can prevent much of this, uh, the, the, the bad things from happening uh, and preserve all of the good that can come out uh, and mitigate those other risks, then there is, there is um, value to, to that equation. If the risk were very high, uh, then it would be irresponsible or reckless to even factor in some of those. But but there is this curve, this risk curve that that we all we all have in our minds, and it's not just one aspect of that value, that being health, it's, it's many other aspects of it as well. And so that's one thing that we've been trying to at least incorporate, not only in our thinking and our planning, uh, but also in our conversations. So the cost also have an impact on health and safety if people lose jobs or things. That was exactly their point, and 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 they wrote they raised the issue of equity and 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 that many of the individuals who would be most harmed, you know, by the financial calamity, um, that that are often those who are um, most disadvantaged and from underrepresented populations, and and so that's just something that they wanted us to make sure that we factored in. I want to call on Larry Chavis, who's actually in the room with us and is the director of the American Indian Center, so looks at this in terms of both faculty and staff issues. Do you have any perspectives that you'd like to share with us about what you see as the challenges as a director center and works with both staff and faculty? Yeah, thanks, Lloyd. So, yeah, again, Larry Chavis, uh, director of the American Indian Center. Uh, yeah, we're really, you know, the goal of our center, one of the main goals is to build community and support students on campus. So we've been thinking exactly some of the things that Bob was talking about. We have some tents uh, in our attic. Are we going to put those out front and buy a picnic table or two to put outside so that students can have lunch? And how do we continue to build community and support students uh, without putting ourselves or students uh, at risk? Uh, the other thing I would say from doing, uh, continuing to do a, a fair amount of online uh, teaching over the summer is I would just encourage everyone to realize that, you know, I sit in a very peaceful cul-de-sac in Meadowmont and I look out over some really nice hydrangeas and it's just peaceful. But so many of our other community members are going through, and we've heard some of them today, just really tough times. And I've had students reach out and say how disconcerting, especially one student in in Minneapolis, how disconcerting it was to hear helicopters outside and then log on to class and a professor just jump into the material. So it kind of, as students are coming back to class, just to uh, encourage my colleagues, uh, faculty and staff, all of us to just say, hey, I know, even if you, you don't have to go full on Black Lives Matter like I do all the time, but uh, you can just say, hey, I'm here for you if you need anything. And I realize times are tough. I think two sentences can go a long way. So that's the other thing we're gonna to try to do is just help our students uh, be at peace. They're gonna come back with a, in a lot of turmoil and you know we're in a lot of turmoil ourselves. And so how do we just help them uh, focus in and do their best in this uh, new semester? 
this uh, first point of our strategic plan, building community together, has taken on meanings we never imagined when we were talking about that. Um, I want to turn now to a question from Melissa Guile, the Vice Chair of Faculty Athletics. Is Melissa in the room? Can we call her in? Melissa has a question from the committee, Faculty Athletics. Take it yeah, away. Here. Um, I love your Paris image. I just have to say that. That's where I want to be right now. But go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, my husband painted that for me. Um, so basically with uh, the faculty athletics committee, the key questions we have are some that a lot that have already been articulated in the chat. Um, we are really interested in uh, particularly how our student athletic population will be impacted by bringing students to campus. Um, starting next week, I believe um, most of the fall sports will be back on campus. Um, I put a link in the chat box to the Carolina, it's called the um, Carolina Athletics Roadmap for Fall 2020. And you can just Google that if you're interested in. That's the official document that the athletics department has put on that. Um, so we're interested in making sure that our student athletes are, are remain healthy and our, their needs are put, uh, are put before, uh, obviously, revenue and, and things of that nature. And we're also, the other piece of that is that we're focused on um, educational equity, particularly when it comes to our underrepresented student populations, many of whom play in some of the larger revenue sports, um, in addition to all of the other of the 28 sports that we have on campus. Um, and we want to ensure that they have um, a true Carolina education with the highest quality that we can provide them. So um, I just wanted to see if we could address more to how are we going to keep our student athletes safe, given that um, some of the, the, the medical concerns are, you know, if you have a bunch of players on a soccer field or a football field um, in close proximity without masks, how do we keep those students safe? Who can respond? Well, How do we keep our players safe? Sure, I'm going to yeah, go I'm going to say something, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Weber because I know he's uh, been very involved with with athletics uh, and, and their sports medicine staff to think about this safe return. But uh, just as uh, I talked about with the ramp up of our research on campus over the past few weeks, we're using that to help inform us as we think about the ramp up of other campus operations. We will use this opportunity as well as we bring. Uh, groups of students back in small uh, groups uh, over the next several weeks to, to learn from that experience as well. And uh, so I, th I think that this, uh, it's all about in informing the, the larger uh, sort of ramp up. And, uh, but Dr. Weber, I know you've been involved uh, uh, with the sports medicine team. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, and I think uh, much as we've already talked about, obviously, uh, uh, during uh, many of the activities, physical distancing and wearing masks are possible. Obviously, you can't be wearing a mask in the middle of a football game, and there are other uh, areas where uh, they cannot. Obviously, to the extent that was already mentioned, uh, playing games potentially without spectators in the stands or distancing them is good. But this is also potentially a role, unlike uh, other aspects of campus uh, where uh, everyone can wear masks, uh, for uh, uh, testing uh, to detect uh, infection in asymptomatic individuals. Uh, and so I think that will play some role uh, in those areas where people cannot wear masks to make sure they can be safe. As well as obviously we need to make sure any teams that we play are following similar guidance that uh, we are and guidance that'll come I'm sure from the national organizations. But uh, testing in this case uh, will play a role. So at this moment, we are planning to go forward with um, intercollegiate athletic events. Has that decision definitely been made? I'm As of today, we are preparing uh, such that there will be a fall season. But uh, but again, we just it's likely it's dependent on uh, you know what other schools are doing. Obviously, I mean, we're trying to work this through the ACC and the conference. There's some talk about well. Uh, we're not going to travel across country to play. They might rethink the schedules and play more locally or just play within conference games. So, so there's also uh, different scenarios and options. But I, I will say, I think Bubba Cunningham and his team have done a great job of putting together a roadmap that uh, follows the same guiding principles that our 
uh, roadmap for the entire university uh, has adopted. And uh, I think he's, uh, they're, they're adjusting it as needed, just as we are with the, the full roadmap. Thank you. Okay, does that, does that deal with the issues, Melissa? Um, so in terms of limiting the risk and exposure, so we, I mean, essentially the, my, I think it, the answer that if I could paraphrase is just, we're, we're gonna do the best we can, wear masks when we can. Um, but I, I feel like we, yes, as Chancellor Guskowitz says, we are plan, preparing to have a season in the fall. But I think, I, I just wanted to say one of the things that we heard yesterday or what, uh, earlier this week in the Faculty Athletics Committee from um, Bubba Cunningham was that we are, all of this is hypothetical, right? They, they are ready to pivot for, um, for any kind of circumstance. And they have a number of off ramps in place uh, to, to facilitate this. So um, I, uh, I, there are a number of questions about like whether or not if we're keeping our athletes safe, but they're exposed to the student body population as well, um, because they're taking a double risk, right? They're exposed, they're, they're exposed to their team, but then they're also exposed to the classroom environment. And I, I um, and even if the athletes are getting tested, no one else is getting tested. Um, and so, I mean, it. what is the parameters of risk that are greater, are the parameters of risk greater for our student athletes? And are we asking them to do more than they're comfortable with? I mean, have, has that been addressed? Again, I, I may turn to David here in a minute, but uh, the fact that they are coming back working in, uh, in, in groups, larger groups, physical, you know, depending on the sport, there's more physical contact. Uh, they're not able to protect themselves through the use of a mask. They are being tested more frequently. And so I think that's uh, a positive and then we're gonna we, we pick up a positive case there and then uh, follow that roadmap from there uh, in, in the procedures, but David. Uh, I would I would say that obviously the safety of our athletes, like the safety of everyone on the campus, is uh, paramount. Uh, and obviously, if uh, the preventive measures that are put in place uh, are failing, then we need to rethink our plans. But uh, currently, uh, I think uh, with uh, adequate mask use and physical distancing at all times, with except very close contact, preferably just on the field, and with adequate testing and with uh, appropriate uh, uh, following the precautions when off campus, I think uh, that we can, uh, at least initially as a plan, allow uh, those sports to continue. But we have to stay flexible and we have to have surveillance mechanisms as we do in place to monitor this. And we have to need to, we need to rethink those plans if they're not working. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. I, I wanna move to Valerie. Is Valerie Poulos in the room? And she has some questions also about transportation, buses and other related issues. Valerie, thank you. Could you come in? <laughs> sure, I'm here. Um, so I have a question about, and so staff, uh, faculty, graduate students, as well as undergraduate students are all affected about transportation to campus. And so some of the questions that we've been pondering are, will there be additional parking options for our graduate students or faculty instructors who need them? What will the bus schedules look like? What will our options be? Um, as well as how is the university working with the town of Chapel Hill to uh, provide safe transportation and um, other measures for students moving in and such? Thank you. Who, who could respond to the transportation? Yes, Bob. Uh, this is Bob Loon. Um, so I meet uh, weekly uh, with the uh, managers from uh, the town of Chapel Hill, Carborough, and, and uh, uh, Orange County. Uh, we, we have talked quite a bit about uh, transportation. It's an important topic. It's an important question because about 60% of our workforce uh, come to this uh, campus uh, via uh, mass transportation. And uh, uh, th they are going to run the buses. Uh, they are gonna have uh, fewer uh, people um, seated on the buses. Uh, they will be practicing our consistent social distancing and they will be strongly encouraging uh, mask wearing. Uh, we will be asking all of our faculty, staff and students who uh, use the buses to make sure that they, they bring their masks and wear their masks 
There will be masks available at, at the stops, I've been told, uh, so that in case you forgot your mask, you could uh, get a mask before you get on the bus. Um, and so uh, we, we will uh, also um, be informed uh, very shortly as to uh, what the increased bus routes will look like. Um, because they're having fewer seats, uh, the concern is that, the, uh, that, that there'll be a, a delay in getting to work. They will be uh, ramping up and have more frequent buses at every stop, and we'll be monitoring that very carefully uh, with them. And so um, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. The, the other uh, question, you know, about um, parking, uh, we're, we're looking at experimenting uh, currently with different kinds of monitoring of parking versus permits versus electronic parking. Uh, and we won't know exactly what the um, parking requirements are until we get a better handle on the, the number of uh, faculty and staff who uh, will seek accommodation and not come to campus. And so once those numbers are in, we'll have a much better handle on uh, what other options we might have for parking. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Does that help, Valerie? The idea of more buses? Parking is still somewhat in play. Uh, I wanted to ask if Ryan is here, Ryan Collins. Uh, could he come in? We had a question about graduate student concerns and teaching. Is Ryan on the call now? Ryan actually just had to hop off uh, to go back to his internship. But if you have a question, I could uh, pass it forward to him. Oh, I, I just wondered if he had any specific comments about fac uh, graduate students' concerns in terms of working with faculty in large classes. Oh, but absolutely. He's not I no, sir. Yeah. Uh, I can't speak on that directly, but I do know he um, he he does have a lot of uh, opinions regarding that. Okay. Well, well, we'll come back to that. I think at an FEC meeting. I want to ask Rohit uh, Ramaswamy. Rohit, are you on the call now? Uh, yes, I am. Rohit uh, is part of a group that's trying to think of new ways to generate conversation. Could you come in with your questions, comments? Yeah, I actually, um, some many of the comments that I am coming in with are from the School of Public Health, and they've already been uh, talked about by uh, Melinda and Kia and others. Uh, but the particular point that I want to make in the short time that we have is the fact that, um, as many others, how many have expressed both in the chat and in the questions today, is that there is a belief that we cannot actually make these community standards work unless we are able to create a culture which, uh, where, where uh, it, it becomes clear to everybody that our role here on campus and in the community is to take care of each other. And therefore, while we might have all the policies and procedures and um, enforcement rules in place, we have not at the same, the, the general feeling is that we've not proceeded in the same way in, by in making community engagement and uh, community caring a equal priority and that we're rapidly losing time in our ability to do that. Uh, there are two um, ideation events that are currently being planned. One uh, by Arts Everywhere, and I think, I think uh, there was a reference to it in the chat, and one by the School of Medicine. And these are independent efforts where uh, we are trying to get community members together to provide ideas about how to take care of each other and how to keep, keep each other safe because we think that that is the uh, that is going to be a critical step to um, ensuring that we are we are maintaining these community standards. But I think there is an overall concern that this has taken a second um, a backseat to all of the other operational processes that have been prioritized. So that's that is the and so I guess the question that we have from, from the public health perspective as the School of Public Health with expertise in health communications, with expertise in community engagement, to what extent are, are this, is this expertise being leveraged to deal with what I think is a really critical aspect of being successful with the community standards as we go forward? Thank so, you. So are you all aware of this open call? Yeah, go ahead. Bob, were you going to say something? Uh, I, I'm, I'm aware of it, of it and, and let me just say it's not taking a back seat, Rohit. So there, I know that we have this public health uh, uh, COVID-19 response co coalition that's working on 
trying to put together communication from, and it's a pan campus initiative. There's a call for some propo for proposals. Uh, I just uh, had an email regarding this this morning from Elizabeth Engelhardt and a few others. So that's one initiative, uh, and I think this is going to be really important for uh, communicating out not only what those standards are, but uh, the responsibility that everybody is accepting when they decide to come back onto this campus to help protect themselves and others. We are um, uh, also meeting. We had, uh, in fact, thank you for participating in uh, one of those meetings this week with uh, groups of faculty, staff, and students around the community standards. Uh, we are still, we want to hear from the community members about uh, do, do you, you know, wh where, what are we missing? And that's kind of where we are. We've been relying on our infectious disease, public health experts to set, help us set the standards, but we're, we're now testing it with these various groups and then it will we'll, we'll set them and they'll be messaged out in part by the work of this coalition i, I know joe tucker is leading a, a campaign to try to joe tucker is joe, very active. joe's part of this coalition and yeah. uh lisa and several others the idea is to get more feedback from the community as we get a more buy-in for this yeah did you want to well, and I just wanted to, to, to thank Rohit again. Uh, we had the opportunity to, to talk about the community standards not too long ago, and uh, am in receipt of uh, some some really excellent uh, suggestions from him. And and I just wanted to reassure uh, him and others, you know, that that those are going to our committee and will be incorporated where possible uh, into the roadmap. So I just want to thank you for your great ideas. Uh, and uh, particularly uh, in how we can do a better job of, uh, of socializing um, uh, the, the, the standards, but also um, creating an environment where it's a little bit easier for either uh, uh, self uh, uh, recognition um, and, and also um, uh, making sure that others around us uh, are complying with those standards and you gave uh, some really nice tools, you know, for us to consider. So thank you. If, if I could only reiterate the sense of urgency in moving forward with this, because I think there really is a sense that if we are not doing this now uh, and we're too late, it's really it's difficult to, um, for, for, for if poor behaviors and poor habits sink in, it's hard to move away from them. And so uh, preparing for them is is important. So I want to reiterate again that this should be an urgent. We should we should treat this with utmost urgency. Uh, we're we're about out of time, but I want to get in one more question. From is Susan Irons on the call from fixed term faculty, or Nancy Fisher from yes. the chair of that committee? Yes. Thank you very Susan. much. Susan. Yes. Susan, you you have some questions about the situation with fixed term faculty. Could you yes. go ahead with that? Yes. Thank you faculty are very concerned about the impact of the pandemic on contract length and on job security. We have three questions. What is the anticipated impact on our job now on our job security? Number two, how can we get updates on that? When can we expect them and from what sources? Number three, can you reassure us of a reasonable and respectful length of time for non-renewal of contract notice? So does anyone want to, who can provide perspectives on the fixed term faculty situation? So I guess, Susan, the question I would have is, has anyone suggested to members of our faculty, uh, our fixed term faculty, that their their jobs are in jeopardy? I do not know specific examples. I think there is general anxiety because there has been a lot of widespread kind of across the across universities concern about what the impact will be, um, because there will be financial impact of the pandemic. You know, how will that trickle down to faculty who are on a contract um, and maybe have a three year, two year, one year, five year contract, and therefore their job security situation is different. But no, I don't know specific instances. There is still general anxiety and concern. Okay. So to the second question, we are uh, still waiting to hear about our uh, budget, uh, the, what the budget shortfall from the state is, uh, what that the impact of the UNC system is, and then what the impact is to UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, that's one source of revenue that's important for the, the salaries of all of our employees, uh, as is uh, uh, tuition, which I talked about earlier, which, which also uh, funds 
a large portion of that. So we, we don't have answers to either of those uh, at this point in time. And so uh, I, I just want to be sure that our faculty have not been told, I hope, <laughs> Uh, that their jobs are in jeopardy. And I, but I do understand the concern with regard to contracted faculty versus tenured faculty. So uh, I, I appreciate the concern. Bob, I don't know if you would add anything, but that's, that's where we are right now. I do think there has been some impact on contract length. People are more hesitant to extend contract length because of the budget uncertainty. And this is where the issue you talked about before of tuition, if we were to lose $50 million hundred million dollars would, I think this is implicit in your question, would fixed term faculty be more vulnerable to that kind of budget cut than tenure track faculty? And I, I understand why that concern is surfacing uh, in that community. And, and then the- oh, So far, nothing has changed. That's the bottom line, yeah. Uh, we have more questions but we are coming to the end of our two hour time and I think we need to wrap this up. And uh, this has been an interesting experiment in hybrid exchange. So now you know what it'll be like to be in a class, Kevin, you know, you'll be kind of there and not there. And this, it kind of has a dialogical element and we really wanted to try something in person because we haven't done this for months. And thank you and thank you, Bob. And thank you all the people in the room and thanks to all of you who joined from um, the wider community. And thank you, Shana, for representing the staff as well. There have been hundreds of people on the call, but now we're gonna go be alone again. <laughs> this, <laughs> if I may end on a philosophical point, my last community meeting as chair of the faculty, this is a lesson in the human condition. Oh, Kevin. I. <laughs> So I, I, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to, uh, to, to Lloyd and Mimi for coordinating this. I'm going to say thank you to all of you who have participated. I'm going to say thanks to all those who participated remotely and are helping us to really get these community standards right. You know, this is, this is not easy, but this is what great universities do. This is what society counts on great universities to do, and that is to problem solve. And, uh, and that's what we're doing. And, you know, Jim Thomas, when I met with him the other day, uh, he said something that resonated with me and he said, you know, pandemics and ep ep episodes like this, it forces us out of our ruts and forces us to get creative. And nobody would have ever imagined four or five months ago would be sitting here, uh, reduced capacity with masks on, trying to solve a problem. And so we are uh, learning how to adapt, but more importantly, we're going to teach others how to adapt. That's what great universities do. And this is what... Uh, what I mean when I talk about the importance of trying to bring students back safely, because that, that generation, this generation of students has an opportunity to help set a new uh, community standard for care and how we care for each other. And I think if they're here and we can create that environment for them, I am confident that, uh, and I've asked you to please trust them. We have incredible students and I think they will adapt and come back here and accept that responsibility that they're gonna be here to help um, learn how to take on that next pandemic or that next whatever it is that they're going to be faced with. So There's always thank you. So as we conclude, I want to say thank you to Vin Stepanidis. I want to thank all of the staff, Helena and Lisa Jean and uh, Khadija for the incredible work you've done to make this happen. And above all, I want to thank Mimi for whom I am happily passing the torch. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I present live from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, the next chair of the faculty. Take it away. What's your final? You have any advice? Let's get ready. Uh, no, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm getting carried away. <laughs> microphone. Oh, microphone. Yes. So. Um, I can't tell you what a real joy it has been to work with Lloyd over the last, I guess, six weeks. I feel like we have been talking almost every day um, and really I didn't know Lloyd before this process. I certainly knew of him, and but didn't know him. So I've learned so much and just have really felt a, a lot of um, gratitude for being able to 
watch how you have navigated these conversations, how you um, bridge so many different parts of the university and bring people together, and um, how you keep your own kind of views often out of it, um, because your role is to really elevate other people's views. So I appreciate that a lot, and it's been a, a good um, learning for me coming into this role. Um, the other night, I did watch um, Kevin on 60 Minutes and also watched the, the uh, president, I guess, from William and & Mary and heard her comments. And I was really struck by one thing that she said when she said that this situation calls us all to tolerate uh, ambiguity, ambiguity and not knowing in a way that we absolutely loathe as human beings. Um, that's a poor paraphrase of her, but that was essentially what she said. And I thought about that a lot, and that, that is what we are being called to do, is to tolerate uncertainty um, and, to, and to become, even though we are in different boats, to try and become some sort of a flotilla where we are protecting each other um, in a really quite a stormy sea at the moment. So I hope that these conversations as they go forward and as our work together as faculty and staff and as we incorporate students into that work, that we really become, um, we recognize our interdependence. I mean, if this pandemic has done anything, it has made all of our society recognize how everything is connected, um, that we cannot do it alone, that we really are never doing it alone even if we think we are. So I hope our conversations will continue to build um, a culture of openness and trust as we go forward that we can model for our students as we bring them back and communicate to them uh, the importance, the important role that they will play. So I'll look forward to our, when we meet again. Thank you all, thanks for doing this. Thank you, and thanks again to the wonderful staff at the Office of Faculty Governance who will make your life easier. <laughs> thanks, so long. Go be safe, go back to your homes and do not come out until you have to. <laughs>